Da, 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 da. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Brewing Boundaries. I'm your host, Lindsay Idaluka, and I'm so excited um, to be having one of my friends on today, Katie Frank, who is going to talk a little bit about music and the music industry. Now, I was really excited to have Katie on because I think that she provides a really unique perspective, not only as somebody who was a singer-songwriter, but as somebody who was chasing their dream for a really long time and somebody who knew when it was time to pivot and also how she could still pursue her passion without, what's the right way to say it? I guess draining yourself. I think that something that we talk about having an outlet is so important. And her talking about the way that she was able to balance that passion and making a living and having a job is really, really interesting. So I'm excited to introduce you guys to Katie Frank. Hope changes everything. The Hope Scholarship at Rhode Island College is the best, most affordable way for Rhode Islanders to earn a bachelor's degree in more than 70 different majors. It's a high-quality four-year degree with the last two years tuition free. That's right, the full college experience for half the price. With new in-demand majors in cybersecurity, sports management, and biotechnology, and starting next fall, AI. Learn more at ric.edu slash hope. All right, Katie Frank in the house. Hello. <laughs> Katie, my roommate. I love you. So I call you my roommate because <laughs> I met you through one of my very best friends and we roomed together at her bachelorette party and now we're just forever roommates. Yep, forever roomies. And I love that for us. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, <laughs> so Katie, I was excited to have you on because first and foremost, if you have not listened to Katie's music, please do so because she's incredibly talented. Um, yeah. And I think that we'll get a really unique perspective um, surrounding mental health from you because making it in the music industry and the music industry in general um, <laughs> is just something that a lot of people don't know about. Yes, it mm. absolutely is something. <laughs> Love <it. laughs> so can you kind of start out just talking about your journey? Um, I know that you went to college in Philly um, mm -hmm. and your decision to go to Nashville, chase music, all that. All right. So we'll start, um, we'll start, I guess I started songwriting like pretty young. Mm -hmm. um, it's always like my passion, you know, through high school, I would do the talent shows and whatnot. Um, but you know how we were so pressured to go to college. You have to go to school, you know, you have to get a bachelor's degree, whatever. So mm -hmm. I realized like, I didn't want to go to school for music mm -hmm. because I mostly play by ear. Um, Hello, kitty cat. I was going to say, little Lupe will be making appearances as, as always. So, <laughs> oh. um, But so I went to Temple. Yep. And didn't do a whole ton of writing while I was in college. Um, here and there. I mean, I, I did. But then um, after college, I ended up moving in with my friend from high school, Will, mm -hmm. who was going to Drexel. And I kind of, um, this was in Philly, in West Philly. Yep. So then I kind of got back into writing. It just kind of the spark hit again. Um, and Will had some friends that would come over. He had one friend um, who's still a good friend of mine. His name is Josh. And mm -hmm. he would always hear me playing. And he's like, you're so good. Um, make a record with me because they went to school for music production. Oh, okay. Um, the music business, I guess. So finally, yeah, he, he did my first EP. Um, Josh Werblin, his name is, mm -hmm. um, and that's actually how I met John, my husband. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. I love that. Yeah. Was the first day, um, I went into the studio cause Josh was friends with John. Mm -hmm. He played drums on my first EP and that's how we met. Then he oh. played my band and yeah, kind of evolved from there. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> So did the uh, Philly music scene for, I mean, a good decade, I guess. Yeah. This thing started, I guess, in 2012, 2013. Um, yeah. So then I think by what I moved to Nashville in 2019, I was working with a different 
producer and things kind of, uh, how do I say this? Didn't work out. Okay. <laughs> All right. He's a, uh, yeah, I, I just was like, um, ended up not putting out the album that we did together and oh wow okay i wanted a total change okay so i started visiting friends in nashville doing little songwriting sessions and i was like you know what i want to try this out so that was what did it i guess hey we always need that push you know something always happens to to kind of get us down to on a different path so how was that for you? I mean, the the music scene in Philly versus the music scene in Nashville, obviously much different. Very different. Yeah. So Philly's got a good little scene. Um, mm-hmm. I would say, like back in the day, it was it's pretty easy to know everybody, like get well connected. It had a decent amount of venues. A lot of them have closed since. Um, new ones have opened. Oh, good. New ones have closed. It's always, you know, kind of a revolving door. But yeah. Compared to Nashville, Nashville is entirely different. It's like, um, I will say the one awesome thing about Nashville is it's like an artist town. So there's lots of artists, lots of music. Everywhere. Yep. And it's like more accepted. Like more people are living the life of side hustles and part-time gigs and like okay. trying to make ends meet. So it's like, it's easier to live that lifestyle there. Mm-hmm. Um, or be a full-time musician, like, if you're playing cover gigs. Um, but it's definitely oversaturated with, like, people who want to pursue songwriting and move there. And it's like, you know, everyone's chasing this dream. And it's some hard. People, there's some people that are really fucking good. And then some people that are like, oh, my God, you're, you're terrible. It's, I'm so sorry. Um. <laughs> <laughs> do you mean, like, writing-wise or do you mean talent-wise or both? Both. There are some okay. people that like so sure of themselves and it's amazing to me because like I have that imposter syndrome thing I mean everyone has that I get that and I I mean that's <laughs> it, it, and it's so interesting because we talk about we talk about confidence and my god I can't imagine the confidence that you need to have to make it in the music industry but you know you mentioned that when you were in Nashville it was so much more accepted to be doing those side hustles and to and to try to you know, be a full-time musician. And can you talk about like the mental health aspect of trying to make it as a musician and, you know, you want time to do your art, but you also need to make money and, you know, you might have a gig on the side and how, how do you balance all that? Um, so it can be tough. It was, um, it's definitely easier when you have a more flexible job or position, like, and if you're someone like me who doesn't want to rely on like I don't want to rely on making an income from my music. Mm -hmm. I mean, that'd be wonderful. But like in order to do that, like people play cover gigs or, you know, a couple hours at a bar. I've never wanted to do that. So I've always had like other jobs. Um, But it it can be really tough. It's yeah. Especially like, yeah. And coming from where I am now in a full-time job and like wanting Mm -hmm. to get back to music. And I'm like, I hate this. That's Um... tough. Cause yeah, it's so tough. And like, you hear like, you know, the, the, the tales of a, the tales of a struggling artist, you know, but, (laughs) but, but it's true because it's so difficult. Like you want to chase this dream, but at the same time, like you got to eat. Yeah. I'm very (laughs) fortunate to have John, like my husband, I want his health insurance. That's nice. Um, and he was able to keep his same job and work remotely mm-hmm. when we were in Nashville, which was nice. Um, so like I worked side hustles, like I worked for families for myself mm-hmm. and then I did cat sitting. Oh, uh, I know we, we both have cats. So. Yeah. Cat lady. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's huge. Do you have friends that were like, or people that you knew in Nashville, like um, who were trying to make art their like mainstream of income? yeah i'm trying to think most of the people i knew like it was the same deal like you'd have a side one of my good friends a lot of people will do like uber eats okay yep friends he does that full time um just has to make a certain amount a week just makes whatever he has to and Mm -hmm. then does music um but most of the people that i knew that were songwriters had some kind of job outside of music 
But then well, there also is like people who are in cover bands and they play like all the bars, the bar scene down there on, on Broadway. Yeah. You can make money doing that, but I think it's all mostly tip based. So I went to Nashville once and like every single place you go, even in the hotel lobby, there's somebody <laughs> playing like every few hours and they have a tip thing. And like, and I was try like, I, I tried to give, you know what I mean? Like at least like a couple bucks, you know what I mean? Because they're, they are, they're good. And I'm like, I look at them and I'm like, oh my gosh, I wonder if they like can eat tonight. <laughs> um, but there is so much talent. There's so, so much talent. I remember I recorded, um, I like sat in the lobby of our hotel for like 30 minutes and like recorded um, this woman, uh, Rebecca, that was downstairs. And she did phenomenal and like talked to her for a while and just picking her brain. And I think that um, music is such a pivotal part of everybody's lives. And think about it. You know, when you go out, when you go shopping, music's on, you're in the car, music's on, you're at a restaurant, music's on. And it's something that people can use to regulate their emotions or when you feel mm -hmm. a certain way, you want to listen to a certain type of music. And a lot of times we don't think of what goes, what goes in behind the scenes and what goes into all that music that we're taking in. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, yeah. That's not something I think people think about. No, right. absolutely. Absolutely <laughs> not. So it's always interesting, you know, to hear stories of artists and, you know, their struggle. And I can't even tell you how many times on like, uh, like country radio, they have somebody on that, you know, was like, Oh yeah. You know, like I was, you know, eating ramen noodles and, and doing this until I got like my big, my big break or, or something like that. Um, so if there's somebody that's listening to this that is, you know, maybe wants to pursue music um, and eat, <laughs> um, what would you, what would be some advice that you would give them? That's a tough one. Um, <laughs> don't do it. No, I'm just, <laughs> <do it. laughs> if it's your passion, if it's what you love, like you don't really have a choice. So like, if you're a female artist, mm. um, be confident in yourself. Um, there, are, it's a male dominated industry and a lot of men, there's a lot of grooming that can happen. Um, mm. also like a lot of just, um, unsolicited like advice from men. Uh, okay. just like, I'm like, okay, I didn't ask for that or whatever, but that's how it goes. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, of course. Has that happened to you? Oh Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, do you have a story that you can share? Um, um, just like little things, like men just, or usually it's men. Yes. Not all men, obviously. Not but, all men, of course. Yes. Um, it's just like giving you feedback after a show, like you should do this or that. And I'm like, how about no? Um, yep. So the person I worked with that um, I didn't want to continue working with yeah it was like more it's, it's often an ego thing okay like for him it was wanting to um do this and play every instrument on the recordings and like just have control over everything and put his name and stamp on everything mm -hmm. um, so yeah and that didn't yeah. <laughs> no, and that's tough. I feel like there's, I, I definitely feel like in any industry like that, like ego is definitely a big, um, yeah. a big, you know, part of the pie, but, and how do you, I was going to say, and what you did, like walking away, can you talk about the decision behind that? Because I feel like a lot of people don't feel confident enough to do that. I think it was kind of like, there was definitely an aha moment. Mm -hmm. uh, where I was like, okay, this is not going anywhere. And this is not something I want to keep doing. Um, so yeah, I just was like, I knew a long time before I actually made the cutoff that I was going to do it. I just, it's like, you know, sometimes you have to, it's like cutting a toxic person out of your life. Like, mm -hmm. um, so that's basically what I did. And then followed by a move to Nashville. It was like probably eight months after that. Okay. I want to say. Okay. So thinking back now, cause now you're back in Philly, I guess. So you've been back in Philly for a year. Almost in April to be a year. Almost a year. Yeah. So looking back on 
you know, your move to Nashville and making that jump and coming back, um, how can you reflect, how can you, how do you reflect on that in, in your journey, like your growth <laughs> as a person and in music? So coming back, so Nashville, it, it was definitely an experience that like I needed to have. Um, I think that sort of my, the, for the entirety of like me pursuing music, I always had this idea in my head that like I needed to make it, I needed to be something or someone by a certain age or whatever. And mm -hmm. like, it was, it was sort of becoming based on that rather than like making the art and like feeling that fulfillment, which is always what I loved about it. Yeah. Um, and I think going to Nashville and doing my first like PR campaign yeah. and have, like view myself as um, a product yep. and like, you know, you're marketing yourself. Of course. Yeah. And it's expensive as hell. I think that's kind mm -hmm. of what finally made me realize mm -hmm. like what it is and like I had to dig deep and figure out what it really was that I wanted out of music. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> do I want to be after this my entire life or do I just want to create art for myself and, you know, enjoy that. And yeah. that's where I ended up. And we always planned on coming back to Philly at some point because our family's here. Yep. Um, so that's what made me, I was like, okay, I think it's time. So we did. Yeah. And, and that's not always an easy decision to make though. No, it's not. Um, and I do miss Nashville, like for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I bet. Yeah. I bet. How is John, um, like, I, I feel that it's, I feel that, you know, when you're in a healthy um, and secure relationship, um, which I know because obviously I know both of you, um, <laughs> there's that added layer of, you know what I mean? When you make that jump and you have that support from that partner, can you talk about how he's helped you, um, you know, make these moves and on how he's helped you through your journey? Totally. Well, I mean, he's been, <laughs> we've definitely been through our ups and downs with, <laughs> um, music. There was a time like before we moved to Nashville, he wasn't even playing in my band all the time because mm -hmm. of those sort of conflicts. Yeah. But, you know, I'm forever grateful that like he was willing to make that move with me. Like, of course. And yeah, endure everything like so much, all the stress of like moving and like deciding to run out our house here and keep it. Like, so, I mean, that's been wonderful. I'm always going to be thankful for that. And he ne didn't necessarily love Nashville. <laughs> Okay. All right. So he must've been happy to come back then. He was, I think, and he'll tell you this too. He's the kind of person who like, doesn't realize how good he has it until after the fact, or like, he doesn't, okay. he doesn't necessarily like see that until after like, Oh, it's like now he'll miss Nashville a bit, you yeah. know, things. And I'm like, Oh, I never thought I hear you say that. <laughs> That's great. That's great. No, I get that. I get that for sure. Um, so you mentioned something earlier that you made an album that you never actually put out. Yes, I did. Um, <laughs> so that, that is so interesting to me. Um, so there has been a lot in the music industry that has come out, you know, in the last, even just the last five years. Um, the first one I think of, to be honest, is Jojo in the sense that she had all this music that she, um, not Jojo Siwa. Um, Jojo, too little, too late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so she put out all this music and she couldn't even make money off of it. And she signed these contracts that she didn't know that she was in and things like that. So, you know, while I have you here, I kind of wanted to talk about that because I can't imagine the mental strain that that has when somebody, I mean, we, we saw it with Taylor Swift, her making her own versions of music and like, like you mentioned, you know, yeah, you got to market yourself, but seeing yourself as a product and not a person, what does that do to a person? Um, it's, it's tough. Cause it's like an inner battle. Like I remember, um, like when I was working, I worked with a PR company and mm -hmm. they were great. You know, they did great things for my EP that I put out, but it was like, creating my bio, like what's your background? What, what are people going to want to know about you? What's like, um, you did this or that, like you had a successful career in the healthcare industry and mm -hmm. decided to pursue music full time because you weren't fulfilled. I'm like, well, yeah, but that's kind of my everyday life. It's, it wasn't really like, <laughs> of I, I wouldn't say my career was successful. 
you know, but it's like making it making you more marketable like what's your yeah. background your story um yeah it's hard and the social media aspect yeah that's difficult too how was that how was that for you um so i don't mind it all the time mm -hmm. I, I got okay with it but it is like the need to keep posting um and now it's totally like i do have tiktok now and you do tiktok too yeah we do tiktoks um we TikTok. <laughs> I like TikTok now. Yeah. But then, like, it's constantly something new you're having to learn. Like, you know, oh. this, social media. And yeah, like, how. I remember when TikTok came out and I was like, and everyone was like, oh, you need to get on it. And this is like right before the pandemic. And I was like, oh, another social media platform <laughs> that I have to keep up with. Like, uh, I was exhausted thinking about it. Yep. I was like, Instagram was all the rage. And I worked so hard to get like Instagram followers and, you know, do all this and that. And then it's like, oh, no. No, no one it's TikTok. That yeah. <laughs> no, and and I think that's so important to to highlight because so many times people, even me, like in my time on the news, like people don't realize like you do everything yourself. You don't have all these people doing this stuff for you. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> so it's like, no, when you're posting, you're doing that. Yep. And yeah, it's coming up with ideas. Lately, I'm just like <laughs> trying to view it as like fun. Okay. You know, having fun with it. Whatever. I Find love your covers. Pe people who will follow me and we interact with each other's videos, whatnot. Yep. Cool. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good, that's a really good attitude to have though. Um, and we, we talked about it on, we talk about it a lot, obviously, like the name of the show is Brewing Boundaries and knowing those boundaries within yourself. And i I think that's a recurring theme here with your story is, you know, you set a boundary when you're working with someone that you didn't want to work with anymore. You yep. set a boundary in your career. Um, and knowing you, I think that that is something that now comes very natural to you. Um, did that always come natural to you? Um, in a sense, like I was always someone who like, I will, if something doesn't feel right, like I'm not someone who can ignore um, a gut feeling or yeah. you know, something that's eating at you. So like, I think that's naturally something for me that, yeah, I have to address. Like yeah. if it's bothering me, I will address it eventually. It may, uh, you know, uh, Wait, but it's Wait, what's your sign again? I forget. I forget when your birthday is. What's your sign? I'm a cancer. Is that a cancer thing? I Maybe. Where's our girl Kelsey when you need her? She I know. <laughs> Probably. We're like, we're supposed to be like the nurturing mothers of the Zodiac, but very intuitive. Okay. And we're a cardinal sign. So they're self-starters. Mm. And whatever, like, yeah. Okay. All right. That makes sense. And my mom's an Aries. Your mom's so an Aries? No, my moon sign is Aries. Oh, your moon sign is Aries. Okay. Well, that's why you're so fierce. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. That said, so, like, when I found that out, I was like, oh, that makes sense. Like, I felt like, sense. but I was like, I don't really relate to all this. I get that. Don't they say, like, your sun sign, like, your your sign is, like, what you put out to the world, but your moon sign is really, like, who you are, like, to people yeah, that. Yeah, your world. Yeah. Your rising sign is, like, how you present to other people or whatever, I guess. I don't know. My rising sign is Pisces, and I didn't think I was that emotional, but apparently I am. <laughs> I can see that. I mean, I have, I'm all over the board. My sun sign is, I'm obviously a Sagittarius. My moon sign is, um, a Capricorn, which makes so oh, much sense because yeah. I want to be go with the flow, but yeah. low key, I got to have things organized and like done and like whatever. And then my rising sign is a Pisces. So I'm all over the place. You are, you got mm -hmm. fire, earth and water and water. That I'm like, I'm Cancer, Sun, Aries, Moon, Scorpio rising. So, oh. water. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. That's so interesting. I love that stuff. And I know that you love that stuff. So, <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> That's so great. Um, so, Katie, also, um, what advice would you have for the people out there who are chasing their dreams, um, be it music or not? I think that obviously, 
you know, music is your background. So we've been very music centric, centric in this conversation, but more importantly, people that are out there that are chasing their dreams that maybe struggle with confidence or struggle with setting boundaries. Um, what would your advice be for them? Hmm. I guess always take time to like, it, I don't know, don't ignore the gut feelings. Obviously take time to check in with yourself and remain true to yourself. Like in the music industry, there's a lot of people that will tell you what you need to do or what you should do. Um, or like you need this or that, like you need to write with other people. If you don't feel like that's something that you need or that you want, don't do it. Keep writing for yourself. And if you feel like your songs are enough, like keep doing it that way. Someone yeah. will listen, you know, it's yeah. not like, yeah, you don't have to take everyone's advice if you don't want to. Absolutely. I like that you said, be true to yourself, because I think that that yeah. is <clears throat> something that's applicable across the board for people everywhere is whether it's something that your family wants you to do, whether it's a career move that somebody's pushing on you, staying true to yourself. Um, you know, it's a little cliche, but it's also harder. It's easier said than done. Oh yeah, definitely. Katie, thank you so much for being on. Is there anything else that you want to share? Um, just on the mental health platform. On the mental health platform. Hmm. Let me think. I don't know, man. Everyone needs an outlet. Doing something creative is always helpful. What, you know, mm -hmm. um, whether it's listening to music, if you knit crochet, whatever <laughs> your podcast, you have your outlets. Like, yeah, I don't know. We all need something that we're passionate about aside from like our full-time jobs. I think that's always really helpful. Like hobbies and interests outside of, yeah, the grind. Of course, outside of the grind. And then, <laughs> then of course, if you ask Katie and I, we would tell you to get several cats. And cats. <laughs> yes, animals are amazing. Animals are amazing. <laughs> oh, Katie, thank you so much. You're the best. Um, I appreciate it as always. Thank you for having me on, Lindsay. I hope oh, it was fun. It's always such a pleasure to talk to Katie, love her and our love of cats together. And I think that she gave some really great perspective and really great advice here, especially when it comes to setting boundaries and making those tough choices. And I think that that's something even myself, I struggle with that. I think that listening to her talk kind of makes me reflect on my time when I decided to leave the news business. And that was something that I decided was no longer fulfilling me. And there were other avenues that I wanted to take. And that's a really good example of setting a boundary in your life. Just because you've been doing something for so long doesn't mean that you have to stay with it. You know, chase your dreams, do something different and make sure that you're doing something that's fulfilling yourself the whole time. So I'm really happy that we had Katie on today and I hope you guys all enjoyed it. And until next time, I will see you then.